Good morning and welcome. I'm Jim Cook, Vice President for Strategic Engagement and Partnerships at MITRE. I'm also the Chair for MITRE Center for Data-Driven Policy. Thank you for joining us today for our discussion, Achieving Equity Through Data-Driven Policies, the first in a series of events on social equity. We created the Policy Center nearly a year ago to bring policymakers, policy influencers, and researchers together with those that execute policy to discuss data and evidence that can help shape actionable, equitable policy decisions. While advocacy plays an important role in policy discussions, our focus is on nonpartisan conversations that engage on data and insights from research and policy implementation experiences, how it works in the wild, so to speak. A national challenge that is the forefront of policy discussions today is racial and social equity. From disparities in access to health, income inequalities, systemic inequalities in benefits and services administration, and law enforcement, government, private sector, and academic leaders are all examining how data can more clearly reveal inequities and measure efforts to correct them. This is why the first paper we've released on this topic focuses on the challenges associated with collecting and using data to assess the impact of policy decisions on equity. For today's session, we have gathered experts to share a variety of perspectives on how to effectively move towards equitable policies and practices. And we've scheduled this event to coincide with and highlight the public launch of our social justice platform, an open source platform to support data-driven collaboration. Before I turn over the mic, I'd like to thank our speakers today for their participation in our event, but also for the leadership that they've demonstrated every day on this very important issue. And now let me turn it over to Dr. Kerry Buckley, Vice President for our Air and Space Forces Center and the Executive Champion for our Social Justice Platform. Kerry, over to you. Good morning. Thank you, Jim. Hopefully folks can, can hear me. I know we might have been having a few audio issues, uh, but I do want to Thank everyone for, for joining us this morning, our speakers and our attendees. Um, I think this is going to be a, a great session that we have in, in, in store for us. Uh, so I would say we certainly uh, recognize that, that the last year has provided many reminders of the, the racial and social inequities that continue to take a tremendous toll on our nation. And as a company, we here at MITRE are dedicated to serving in the public interest. We are committed to, to making a meaningful difference through our social justice platform. And a little bit about our social justice platform, as, as Jim mentioned, um, we are utilizing the power of our systems engineering and analytical expertise um, at MITRE and across the community to help shape relevant tools, frameworks, data, um, and practices that can be used by anyone. We've reached a milestone this week. As Jim mentioned, we launched a website that not only makes our work accessible to all of you, but also invites you to contribute your solutions and insights to this community forum. The link to the site will be in the chat and um, will also be provided after the last speaker. So with that, let's get started. It's our first speaker is, is Nancy Potok. Um, she's going to set the context for the day by discussing the motivations and expectations behind the recent Biden administration actions. Then uh, we're gonna be joined by our panel of experts um, and they are the folks who are really in the trenches together um, and on working with our social justice data, partnerships, working policy issues. And they're gonna dis discuss how we can move forward together to achieve an equitable vision, not only in our federal programs, but also with partners at the state and local levels and outside of government. And finally, Dr. Barry James will share um, what comes next in, in the fireside chat. There will be questions and answer periods um, for, for Dr. Potek and, and the panelists. So please do uh, put your questions in the chat during these, during these segments and we will try to get to as many as we can. So with that, it's my, my pleasure to introduce Dance, uh, Dr. Nancy Potok, the CEO of NAPEX Consulting. Uh, Nancy served as the Chief Statistician of the United States in the Executive Office of the President for three years until January 2020. During this time, she also served as a Commissioner on the U.S. Commission of Evidence-Based Policymaking and Co-Chair of the Federal Data Strategy. Nancy previously served as Deputy Director and Chief Operating Officer of the U.S. Census Bureau, Deputy Undersecretary for Economic Affairs at the U.S. Department of Commerce, Senior Vice President for Economic, Lab for Economic Labor and Population Studies 
at NORC at the University of Chicago and Chief Operating Officer at, Mac at McManus and Monslave Associates, a data analytics and organizational transformation firm. She's been an adjunct professor and senior fellow at the George Washington University and as a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration and a non-resident fellow at the Urban Institute. Nancy chairs the Board of Trustees for the Institute of Pure and Applied Mathematics at UCLA, serves on the Board of Visitors for the University of Pittsburgh School of Computing and Information, and is a contributing editor to the Harvard Data Science Review. And finally, she received her PhD from the George Washington University Trachtenberg School of Public Policy and Public Administration. Nancy is a very, very busy person, so we are truly honored to to have um, Dr. Potip with us today. And, and let me go ahead and turn it over to you. Uh, thanks so much. I'm um, gonna do a screen share, if I may. Thanks, sorry for the delay. Um, but I do wanna talk a little bit as, um, as was said about um, sort of from a government perspective, this idea of um, achieving equity. And, um, I, you know, it kind of starts with the um, executive order that came out right at the beginning of um, this administration, um, the executive order 13985, which I hope um, people are familiar with, but if not, it's on um, whitehouse.gov and you can read it pretty easily. But um, I think the concepts there are really important and where it puts federal agencies is really important um, in terms of their activities and how to sort of think about this and approaches that are available um, in this whole network really um, of partners inside and outside of government and at all levels of, of government, state, local, federal, um, that really need to work together to tackle these tough issues. This is not a solo project for anyone involved. Um, but I think the policy that the federal government should pursue a comprehensive approach um, says quite a bit. Um, so we're looking at a systemic approach. We're looking at embedding fairness in decision-making. Um, these are very significant and carefully chosen words. I can um, sort of vouch for that. I was on the um, Biden transition team. Um, and I know that there is a lot of um, emphasis on really taking a systemic approach and using data and really understanding the outcomes of um, federal actions and programs, and most importantly, dollars, um, how dollars are going out and being spent and are they really achieving the outcomes that they're supposed to. So we start with, with a really strong policy statement and a lot of um, what I would call muscle and, and belief and strength behind that. Um, and a very sincere desire to make real changes in the way government serves people. And then we have another foundational block, which is very, very important and uh, contains multiple, not just requirements, but tools um, for federal agencies to move in this direction. And that's the Foundations of Evidence-Based Policymaking Act. Um, it has three titles. I, I hope most of the people who are tuned into this are, have at least some familiarity with this, but I will just talk about it briefly. Um, so Title I um, really talks about federal evidence building activities and um, creates an advisory committee to OMB to look at how data are being used, creates chief evaluation officers in agencies and um, sort of senior statistical officials to really um, look at this requirement that agencies put together um, a strategic learning agenda. And um, so now we can see, okay, agencies have to put together a learning agenda. And one of the things they should be learning about are how their programs really affect people in society through an equity lens. 
Um, the second title, the Open Government Data Act, is the part that it establishes a chief data officer in each agency, sets up the chief data officer council, and has um, some really good um, requirements in it telling agencies you really have to manage your data and make it more accessible. So open data um, in particular needs to be cleaned up. It needs to be interoperable. You have to put inventories together and you have to really get feedback from the public on how useful the data are and act accordingly. And then Title III really gets to the heart of a lot of the data that would be used um, in evaluations because it's the confidential data. It's the most sensitive data that really the statistical agencies are working on now, but a lot of the, the confidential data in government actually comes in programmatically when you sign up for a benefit program, for example. And what this does is it takes the statistical agencies which have been working with this very sensitive data, uh, agencies like the Census Bureau, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, National Center for Education Statistics, et cetera, and um, makes them the trusted agents for thinking about how you link data together to really get to understand what outcomes are when you're doing evaluations or you're looking at program. So now you have two really important pieces. You have an executive order that says we need this broad look at what's going on and agencies are required to take this seriously and report out and make changes um, if those changes are needed. And we have legislation that gives agencies many of the tools that they need. But that's not sufficient. So there are um, there are three really key ingredients for success um, to take those foundational pieces. Um, one is the evidence in the data community itself and how you build that community and strengthen that. Um, the second, of course, is the investment and effort that you need um, to do that kind of building and to really um, stick with it and make this successful. So it's not sort of the flavor of the month of, you know, now we have this requirement that we're supposed to look at equity. We'll do that until we don't anymore. Um, and then there is what, what I would call the agenda for the future because you really have to know where you're going um, to, to start planning and putting the things in place for today. So I wanna talk about each of the three of those for a minute. When we talk about the evidence in the data community, we're really talking about these pieces of a networked system, kind of a data ecosystem, so or an ecosystem, not an echo, an eco. Um, so we've got the, the executive order, we've got the Evidence Act. Um, the executive order actually sets up an interagency working group on equitable data. And that's composed of the federal agencies. Federal agencies have a lot of that data, but you can't leave out the communities that are affected by the programs. Uh, I think that's one thing that people have really learned from having unsuccessful interactions in the past, which is that you must really um, include and listen to the communities that are being affected or receiving benefits from the federal and the state programs, that, that it's not a one-way street. It doesn't just all flow out from the government. That's not effective. And the state and local agencies are often kind of where the rubber meets the road. They're, they're key, they have really good data, and they're often the front line of service delivery on many things. Um, and then we've got academia, the funders, there's a lot of philanthropic organizations putting money into pilot projects and uh, really interested in these outcomes. And we have the private sector, which has multiple roles in terms of developing technology, um, in terms of being service providers, um, in all across the whole data ecosystem. Um, and each of these is really important and they have to work together. Um, in investment and effort, some areas where I think the, the most investment and effort is required is we have to take the data that already exists. There's, there's so much valuable data that's sitting in agencies, both in state agencies and federal agencies. It has to be made more readily available, more accessible, 
and usable in terms of um, standardizing it, in terms of interoperability, in terms of how you can um, get to the data to use it in studies or um, to, for better service delivery, all of these things. And sometimes we're missing data. There's no doubt about it. Um, it's data collection is spotty in terms of some of the, what I, I call them variables from a statistician standpoint, but characteristics of, of people and populations. Um, so you want some demographic characteristics in there. So you know, um, kind of are, are, is there a, a differential in the way that these services are being delivered or the way that people are benefiting from um, government programs? And you, you wanna be able to sort of slice and dice that by a lot of different characteristics to see if there is a differential uh, inequality there that some populations are, are benefiting more than others in a way that is not equitable. And some of that data just isn't available now. A lot of it is, but a lot of it isn't. So that needs to be addressed. Um, tools need to be um, continue to be developed. There's some really neat tools out there right now that help analyze data, but I, that needs to progress. Um, privacy issues are really important and informed consent issues. Um, it, you know, there's people on a whole spectrum of what you need to do to access very sensitive data. But that technology, the philosophy, um, the, the context of how we look at privacy and use sensitive data really uh, needs to be um, tackled as well as the ethical approaches. Um, and at, by ethical, that's very broad. I mean, inherent biases that may be in the data that you're using and also how you use the data and how you engage the, the people or the businesses whose data that you're using. Um, that There's a lot of discussions underway. I have not seen sort of a consensus on this is the standard that everybody should be using in these different contexts. And then strengthening the partnerships. Um, that's a lot of work. You know, it's easy to say you should set up these partnerships, but I personally have seen it take years sometimes to develop these partnerships, to put um, sort of agreements in place, memorandums of understanding, particularly in government. And so to the extent that those things can be standardized and regularized and encouraged, um, and people are willing to stick with it, I think that's gonna be um, really a key element in being successful with this. So um, let me just say for the next steps and the agenda for the future and thinking about what are we doing now in terms of how it's going to affect our ability to sustain this in the future, I've come up with sort of six key things that um, I hope this community would be thinking about. So we need to continue to equalize access to the data. Um, some people have started calling this democratizing data. So it, you can't have the data in a in a in such a way that only a few elite researchers or um, you know it, that people don't have access to what they need. We we need to really look at how we protect the data, um, but make it more accessible. That's a that's a big issue right now. Um, and I think we need to continue to educate and train the data producers and the users. Um, I've seen some very successful projects ongoing where people in the state agencies and the local agencies can come in and start sharing data and linking it in a very secure, safe environment. But they learn how to do that and learn how to use it on the job on an ongoing basis. It's, that's really important. Um, and then improving the existing tools and products. I think I've, I've touched on that. that. That in and of itself could be a whole webinar talking about what tools are out there, what products exist and how they are developing and the role of these partners um, in academia and the private sector and the nonprofit sector in, in developing these tools. Um, so then standardizing where meaningful gains can be realized for most people, um, the light went on during the pandemic when they realized that health data, for example, is not very interoperable, that if you have local governments reporting what's going on, there was no standard. Um, it was very hard to compare apples and apples and really understand what's going on. 
Um, and especially when you start looking at communities and low levels of geography, where often that's where the equity issues are. So um, I've also seen very successful efforts, and I'd like to see more of them, where, for example, the federal government would give grants to states and to um, local agencies to, to standardize the data, that everyone agrees on a standard, and then the money is there and the resources to actually undertake whatever has to be done to change the data collection systems, the, the, the um, IT, but it's not just IT modernization. It really doesn't help without looking at the content and the data and how to handle that and, and standardize it so that you can um, make comparisons and do the analyses that need to be done. Again, the ethical issues, um, those are out there. I think they're just really in, in some instances, they've been explored quite extensively in academia. I think not so much in government um, and government really needs to tackle those issues and bring in um, some thought leaders in there on, on how to address the ethical issues and think about bias that's in existing data and um, the whole idea of informed consent and then engaging uh, the data science community is very, very important, especially in improving tools and products, but also because um, the data science community really um, is a very broad community. And so there are people already thinking about privacy and bias in data and, and all of these things, finally, um, especially, you know, it's taken a long time. There's for people who think about those things to join up with computer scientists who just sort of love, I, I know there's some computer scientists out there, but I think there's been an evolution in thinking about the use of large data sets, big data, just because it's big, it doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> so um, thinking about that in the context of bringing people together to solve actual problems, to really focus on tangible issues that can be addressed is very important. Doing this in the abstract doesn't really make sense. So thinking about these problems, um, I think is the important thing. So I will leave it at that. And um, I think if that's the end of my slideshow, so I will stop sharing and, Thank you, um, you. you know, happy to address any questions in whatever time we have left. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, for sharing your thoughts with us on this important mission and some of its challenges. I am, um, this is Janine Patterson, and I'm going to start off by um, asking one of the questions that came in through our chat here. Um, it, the first question is, um, if past research or statistics were, were based on biased data, does that mean all the past research or statistics are now identified as obsolete? Should those data be uploaded, up, I'm sorry, updated with an asterisk? Um, I guess my answer would be, it depends. Um, it, one of the things that's very important is to know where the data come from. So if you were looking at data, for example, from the Census Bureau or um, a statistical agency, the statisticians in those agencies are really good about measuring error, about doing rigorous um, random samples, about stratifying levels of the population to, to not have biased data. Now, admittedly, you, bias is really hard to measure, but I think if you went, for example, to look at data sets from one of the federal principal statistical agencies, um, you would find enormous documentation that would tell you all about what how to use the data and where there may be errors. So I think it's fine if it's, if you know what you've got and it's documented, um, that's fine. Where I think the issues will come up is um, not sort of the random sample surveys that statistical agencies have traditionally done. I think those are actually quite good for the most part and you know what you're getting. But when you start combining survey data and program records, let's say you wanna combine it with information from SNAP or from, you know, WIC, then or crime data, for example, that gets reported from, you know, the input comes from local police departments. Those sometimes have a lot of errors in them. So you need to 
understand the key thing is understanding what's in it you wouldn't discard everything from the past but you do have to know kind of the quality issues and right now i think that's one of the things that has to be worked on is how do we describe the quality of data when we've combined it from multiple sources um, that all may have different biases in it that's a that's an issue that this data ecosystem really has to tackle with the data scientists and the statisticians and people who understand the data. I think relating, thank you for that. Um, I think I think relating to that point, this last point that you were making, another question has come in. Perhaps part of the innovation is to examine how we have a tendency to look at data as objective entities rather than artifacts of the political environs in which it is created. How can we begin by holding data with a level of curiosity that would help us understand reasons for incomplete data and strategies for collecting uh, meaningful and comprehensive data? Well, I think that's where the community involvement comes in. Um, that's why it's really important to um, engage. You can't, you know, if you're a demographer or, uh, you know, you study eth ethnography, um, ethnographics, you, you want to engage the community. You, you can't just like do this in a vacuum. Um, and I, you know, you can look at in, in existing data sets, I think there's a lot of documentation that people have ignored. I mean, if you look at something like the unemployment rate, um, it's no secret that the only people who show up in the unemployment rate are people who are actively seeking work, not people who are discouraged workers. They're not in there. They're not in the denominator if you haven't been actively seeking work. Once you understand that, then you can say, well, how do we start to measure the discouraged workers and who are they and what are their characteristics? How do we capture that information? So I think you have to start by understanding what you have, but it's this push that I think is coming. The executive order is really important for pushing agencies, at least at the federal level, to start um, having that curiosity, not to just say, yes, we know they're not included, end of story, but okay, let's start thinking about what data is out there that would start to inform this. And I do think that some of the outside researchers in academia um, and the people in nonprofits, for example, who are asking these questions and community um, representatives who are aware of problems in their community because of these um, um, absences of being represented in the data that are being studied need to have a voice um, and that's where the curiosity will come from in the people who are actually putting these data sets together for, for people to um, access. So it's, there's got to be many more voices in this that are not just there in some federal advisory committee, but actually listened to in a meaningful way, which doesn't always happen right now. Thank you. Um, another wonderful answer. And I think uh, it seems like you're, you and the audience are very much in alignment here. Um, so the DOT uh, has, has a new RFI, um, Request for Information Seeking Input and Advice on Improving the Department of Transportation's Data and Analytics, analytics Approaches to Address Transportation Equity Gaps. I think is very, again, aligns with what you're saying, a key problem will be the invisible population of those who need transportation but do not show up in the data because they have not historically been users of the system. So you talk a lot about uh, community engagement and I'm just wondering if, if, uh, if there are any other kind of um, pieces of advice you can offer for how, how we might address this, um, the, this invisible population yeah. and is the census data a useful tool to understand what the denominator should be? Yeah, the census data is very useful. I, I strongly um, recommend using that to understand characteristics of the population at low levels of geography. Um, if you wanna understand communities, especially the data from the American Community Survey. I mean, it's not perfect by any means, um, but it's, it's really good. Um, relative to anything else that's available that you can compare across the whole country. Um, and I, I guess, you know, if I were 
DOT. They haven't asked for my advice, but if I were DOT, um, I, I would not necessarily rely on an RFI because, you know, who reads RFIs? You're going to get some voices, but there'll be a lot of, um, you know, self self-named representatives of communities that may or may not be able to really represent the voice of the community. And um, one thing, for example, that the Evidence-Based Policymaking Commission did was it held hearings in different locations to get um, input from the public. And I think, you know, federal agencies can do a better job of, of going to their constituent groups instead of putting something out that's in the federal register that only, for the most part, people in DC read. Um, and that's, that's not gonna get to the people that they wanna hear from. So that's part of this level of effort and partnership. You know, and maybe, I, I can't speak for DOT, they may be doing that. They have state transportation agencies they're probably working through as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of, that's a very localized network because the way the things like the highway money go out and transit money and things like that. So there's very good connections there with local agencies who, who do know their constituents. Um, and so there's multiple ways they're probably collecting that information besides just through an RFI, but that's the kind of thing you have to do. You have to really go where the service delivery is and make sure that, um, that you're collecting information and advice and input um, at the sort of the ground level where, where the services are being delivered, I think. Even if you're giving grants to a state, if you wanna understand better, you really have to hear those local voices. And that is, that's part of the effort and the perseverance that, that needs to be there. Awesome. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe just one more, um, one more question. And I'm going to go into the, the, the MITRE pool here. This is a question from the MITRE team. Um, the Equitable Data Working Group has an ambitious agenda. Um, what should we be looking for that group to accomplish in the first two years or so? And, and how can the um, community outside of government help? Yeah, that's an excellent question. You know, one of the one of the things that I'm uh, sad about in um, leaving government was that that interagency group was supposed to be co-chaired by the chief statistician. So had I stayed, I would have been able to co-chair that group. So I can share a vision of what I would think from the chief statistician standpoint of what that group should accomplish, um, and that is um, really I identifying, starting out with what are the key questions and the key areas under that executive order um, that agency heads have identified as high priority areas. You know, maybe there's like really a lot of money going out to particular programs or certain services that are really key if they're, you know, food security, social safety net programs, or whether they're transportation grants, um, there's all kinds of things going, I mean, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars from the federal government. So the agencies that are doing that need to really know what's happening. And so the agency had to have to identify these programs. I would start with taking those programs that have been identified and looking at what are the questions that you need to ask about them and then what data do you need to answer the questions. What I've seen most often in my government experience is that agencies often start with the data that they have and then they formulate the questions. And to me, that's completely backwards. You have to formulate your questions first and then you find the data and your, the data may be in another agency. And that's why you want an interagency group because you, what their group needs to do is facilitate access to data that may be located in different places in government to look at the whole kind of mosaic of these big questions, which are often interrelated between agencies. And it doesn't help for one agency to look at this. And an example I can give, for example, would be um, like gun violence. 
is a is a public health issue. You need health data, you need crime data, you need education data to look at violence in the schools. Um, all of those have to come together in a meaningful way, not just a compilation of, okay, here's all the school statistics, here's all the crime statistics, and over here, here's some health data. But this interagency group has got to be focused on, well, how do we knit that together so that we actually understand the dynamics that are happening? And maybe we need some census data and we need to some, you know, we need to geocode the data to see neighborhoods. Um, and then we need the demographic characteristics. And if we're really going to tackle this in some meaningful way. So that's the kind of thing that that interagency group ought to be doing is really thinking about those big questions that cross agencies and bringing in the key people from those agencies and saying, let's get this done, finally. Wonderful. Um, again, a, an excellent answer. Thank you so much uh, for, your, for your time with us this morning um, and for all of your insights. Um, uh, we, we really do look forward to seeing how the um, Equitable Data Working Group um, and this broader ecosystem of partners, you know, move forward to tackle some of these big issues. So thank you. Uh, thank you again. Sure. We're going to transition now to our panel discussion um, entitled Developing Solutions, Human-Centric Design, Systems Thinking, and Data Best Practices. Uh, it promises to be a phenomenal discussion. Um, facilitated by Dr. Irving Lacho. Uh, Dr. Lacho is a senior principal here at MITRE. He spent over 25 years working at the intersection of technology and policy uh, issues and currently leads MITRE's social justice platform, which provides data, tools, and frameworks that address social, economic, and health inequities. Before I turn it over to Dr. Lacho to introduce the panelists, I'd just like to invite our audience to continue to add any questions you might have in the chat, and I'll do my best to raise them later during the Q&A session of the panel. Over to you, Irv. Thanks, Janine. Good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to be moderating this very distinguished panel. Uh, I'm gonna begin with some very brief uh, bios of the three panelists. And I urge everyone to please uh, Google them and, and uh, check out their more extensive um, biographies because they're, they're super impressive. And we're, we're very fortunate to have all of you with us here today. And then we'll launch right into the discussion. So I'll begin with uh, Dr. Krishana Jackson Leftwich. She's a professor of public affairs and politics at Youngstown State University, where she also serves as the program coordinator of the political science program. Her research interests focus on anti-racism, social equity, cultural competence, and gender equality. Since joining the faculty at Youngstown State University, Dr. Jackson has also served on numerous committees. Next, we have Dr. Brian McClure, who's the director of the Council Office of Racial Equity for the District of Columbia. Prior to joining CORE, Brian served in several leadership capacities for DC Council member Kenyon McDuffie, and the Council's Committee on Business and Economic Development. There, he helped lead the district's efforts to operationalize racial equity into the Council's legislative process. He also helped provide innovative solutions to increase opportunities for the district's small and local businesses, and in particular, Black and minority-owned businesses. And finally, we have Dr. Brian Levy, who's uh, an assistant professor of sociology at George Mason University. Dr. Levy studies social stratification with a focus on neighborhood effects, on socioeconomic outcomes, and their role in economic and racial inequities. Prior to joining George Mason, Brian was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University Sociology Department. And from 2009 to 2012, he was a presidential management fellow and a social science analyst at the US Department of Health and Human Services. So thank you all so much for joining. And let me start off with a question to set the stage for our discussion which is, um, how do you define equity? And why don't we begin with uh, Dr. Leftwich? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Thank you so much for the great introduction and inviting me to join the panel. And when we talk about equity, I tend to look at it from a social equity framework. And so one of the things that uh, one of the definitions is trying to provide fair and equitable services 
across all platforms, especially government platforms, and making sure that all populations, even underrepresented populations, have access to services. And so in my just researching things, what we discuss is that equity isn't always equal because what might have to happen is we may have to provide more services for certain groups who have been disenfranchised or who don't have access. So there's a little bit of difference between equity and equality, but the goal is at the end for everybody to be equal. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Levy? Yeah, thank you for having me. And I would echo what Dr. Jackson Lefwich has said here um, in, in totality. And I think it's sort of a tough question in some ways because we've never actually accomplished this in the United States, right? Um, mm -hmm. And in some ways you don't know uh, that you've achieved equity until after the fact. Um, but I think we can aim for it. And so, uh, for example, uh, when equity might not look like equality, um, we can think about equity in specific contexts like school funding. Um, so for a long time, income level of a school district was strongly associated with the funding per student in that school district and there was not equality or equity. Uh, today, we see much more equality in school funding levels, but it actually takes more spending in low income school districts to achieve equivalent levels of student outcomes across districts for a whole host of reasons, historic underinvestment in those communities, less experienced teachers in some communities, uh, perhaps greater breadth and variation in needs of students, et cetera. Uh, so that's one example where we see equity um, not being equivalent to equality. Um, so I think like Dr. Jackson Lefwich said, um, it's really important to look at the resources uh, and opportunities that specific individuals need uh, to realize their full potential and achieve healthy lives. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Levy and uh, Dr. McClure. Yeah, and thanks again for having me and uh, thank you to the uh, entire MITRE team uh, who have been great partners with the DC Council Office of Racial Equity um, we're, so we're very grateful to be here speaking with you all today and to my fellow panelists, it's good to see you all as well. Um, here in DC, uh, we specifically focus on racial equity and we believe racial equity is the moment when one's race uh, actually no longer predicts one's outcomes or the way in which uh, resources are distributed. Um, similar to what Dr. Uh, Jackson left, which uh, just described. Um, and Dr. Levy, I think also hit the nail on the head that there are um, important distinctions between definitions as far as equity, um, equality. Um, but here within our office, we are focused on uh, the process of achieving racial equity as well as the outcome um, of racial equity. And very quickly, I'll say when we talk about racial equity in terms of a process, we're talking about the mechanism of applying a racial equity lens uh, to legislation, uh, to how data is collected, um, to any decision that is made to community engagement. That racial equity lens, um, in short, asks a series of very critical questions, such as what is the historical trauma that has led to the existing racial inequity um, that we see? And so as Dr. Um, Levy mentioned, we see these inequities across uh, education uh, and housing um, and business ownership uh, and who has access to government services, um, what government services are even offered. Uh, and so we must ask, um, how do we begin to redress the historical trauma? Um, and so uh, I think we'll talk a little bit more about um, what DC is doing to address some of these concerns, but in short, uh, that's what we mean when we talk about racial equity. Fantastic, thank, thank you so much. Um, so I'd like to, to follow up by asking uh, the three of you to talk about uh, the, the greatest challenges that you see to actually achieving these goals. And I, I, I'm very curious to hear your perspectives because of where you sit and your experiences between you know, academia, working in the federal government and working at the, at the local level. So um, uh, Dr. Levy, uh, let's start with you. From your particular perspective, what do you see as 
some of the greatest challenges to, to getting where we want to go. Oh, uh, you're muted, sir. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, thanks. Uh, <laughs> you know, just a year and a half into Zoom and still figuring out the mute <laughs> button. Um, sure. So one challenge, I think, uh, which Dr. Potek mentioned uh, in the introduction is uh, data availability, right? And I'm sure we're going to touch on this more uh, yeah. later in the panel. Uh, but one example that I'll highlight here um, beyond just data availability is once we have the data uh, themselves, how we measure and operationalize things. So data collection, uh, is a politicized process. We could uh, spend a whole panel on that, um, but I'll, I'll touch more on uh, measurement and operationalization uh, by the researchers and the importance uh, of digging in to the materials and the documentation about how data are collected, uh, but also in just thinking about what we're measuring. So um, one example could be race and ethnicity. So obviously a social construct, which has no biological basis, um, but racial and ethnic identification of individuals can change uh, based on who's measuring it. Um, it can also change uh, among individuals depending on their social context, uh, their life, their position in the life course, how their uh, situation changes across their life course. And so uh, this has implications for how we can understand disparities. And it, in some ways, it can also elucidate uh, some of the processes that are ongoing in constructing uh, and reifying disparities. Um, beyond uh, data availability and access, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, what I see as the biggest challenge, which is political will and whether or not uh, folks actually see uh, equity as a problem. So rightly or wrongly, uh, many folks see a lot of uh, this discussion as zero sum. Uh, we can look back at affirmative action policies, for example. Uh, earliest beneficiaries tended to be white women. Uh, and once affirmative action policies began uh, to benefit more Black individuals, we saw political backlash against affirmative action. So I think political will is a, a real challenge here. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. McClure, what, what thoughts do you have on this? Yeah, and I would just add uh, to what was just said, you know, Data is, is a huge problem, I think, that's been discussed. Um, here uh, in, in, in DC, um, we, our, my office is actually tasked with conducting what we call RIAs, or Racial Equity Impact Assessments, which um, when uh, permanent legislation makes its way through the council, uh, we conduct uh, these um, research evaluations to determine whether a bill will actually benefit uh, um, black persons and other persons of color, or if they would uh, perpetuate harm or maintain a status quo of racial inequity that currently exists. And so one of the problems that we've uh, begun to run into is this problem of time. And so even when we sit down, we conduct an analysis and says these policies will be harmful, um, we still find that we are running against the clock. So a lot of times, uh, Council members may be moving legislation that's time sensitive. Um, members may be, you know, just trying to pass a bill that's solving an immediate problem that's in front of them. And so it's, well, we need to move this because of uh, whether it be political pressure, whether it's solving an immediate problem. Uh, and although they, they, they have this information that a bill may be harmful, it, they may fall back into this pattern of what they have been, uh, uh, accustomed to doing. Um, and so although we are implementing this new process, um, it's in a sense uh, has the potential to slow down the traditional political processes, which is what the process of racial equity should do uh, and what has not happened. You know, people um, have passed legislation that have not, and generally have not thought about how would this negatively affect certain communities. And so when you actually hold something up, to say that it will, then people have to stop and wrestle with it. Um, the, I'll end by saying that it has been a very enlightening process to see uh, local DC council members respond to it because they have overall been very receptive 
Um, and just to see them wrestling with these questions in ways that, and, and wrestle with these questions in a very public way, uh, is something that has not happened before. Um, it's not easy. And so, you know, we're moving from the theoretical or just the, the, the pure research of these questions. And I'm saying, this is what's happening in real time. So to get people to stop, to think through it is something that we're all adjusting to uh, on the fly. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate that insight. Um, Dr. Lefwich? Yes, I think um, both of my fellow panelists have kind of hit the nail on the head a little bit, but I would also like to add that when we talk about policies and data, we have to look at how we are analyzing and collecting the policies. For instance, I'm at a university and we got some CARES Act money. And one of the things they were going to do was they were going to distribute computers and hotspots for students that needed those resources. And so they were like, well, you know, none of our students really needed the, the resources. And so the question was, well, how did you collect the data? They said, well, we sent out an email. So I said, so you electronically sent out a message to ask students who needed electronic devices? They said, yes. And they all responded that they had them. I said, because the students who don't have them didn't get the, you know, didn't get the, 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 the survey. And they looked at me kind of like, huh. And so I think we just kind of take for granted that, you know, when the campuses were open before the pandemic, that students had access to computer labs and could respond to emails or that they use mobile devices. But, you know, I was like, you might have to, you're going to have to mail out surveys to some of these students and try to contact because I know that we don't have 100% students um, that have Wi-Fi as a professor. And I have students in my courses who don't have access to Wi-Fi. And so I think it's very important when we, we have money and policies put in place, but the distribution becomes unequal um, because of the way we are collecting or the way that we're looking at the data. So we have to be very mindful for, for that. And I think also sometimes what happens is we've been doing things a certain way for a long time. And when the data shows us that things need to be done a different way, it makes us uncomfortable. When we really start seeing these racial disparities, we don't want to say that it's just race. We want to say that it's income. We want to say that it's all these other factors. And we had to have some difficult conversations when we were distributing money and we had to say, we tend to do scholarships for students of color, but it's not the students of color who are, are not graduating or who, are, who, or who our retention rates are down for. It is the black students. It is the African-American students, not the students of color. And we really need to address that because we're trying to be inclusive but what we find out, the problems and the issues aren't, they're not exclusive. They're very specific to a certain group. And so, and that is what the data was showing us. And that is what the graduation rates were showing us. And that is what the retention rates were showing us. And so while it made some people uncomfortable to have these conversations, the reality was there is a group of students that we are missing. And we need to figure out what kind of policies from the state from the local and from a university perspective that we are gonna put in place if we are truly going to do what we say we're going to do to meet our goals, to meet our strategic mission and to be the university and just to be the entity serving the community that we say we're going to be. Thank you. That very, very uh, great example that you gave. <laughs> Fascinating perspective. And so I, I actually wanna follow up uh, uh, on what you said and, and what uh, uh, and come back to you, Dr. McClure, because uh, you were talking about um, focus on racial equity. And um, uh, we know that you've uh, working on a racial wealth gap study uh, in the city of DC. Uh, and a question I have for you is, uh, what are some of the insights that you think uh, you've gained from focusing on racial equity that, that first of all, if you want to share those, that would be uh, terrific. But also, uh, can that be applied to other aspects of equity, whether it's a focus on uh, wealth, um, you know, economic equity uh, for other populations, health, um, or some other aspects of equity that, you know, within the broader context, you know, uh, things that might be applicable, for example, to the executive order, which Nancy Potok mentioned earlier, which has a very, very broad view of equity, at, at least at the federal government level. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, one of the things that immediately began to jump out to me um, as we undertook this work, and our office launched uh, in January of this year, and um, 
One of the things we immediately began to do was to conduct racial equity trainings. Um, and we immediately began to realize that uh, government officials, their level of understanding for all these different terms that we've been using, right? Equality, equity, racial equity. There are um, very different levels of understanding. And so we made uh, a lot of assumptions that people, whether it's members, staff, even the public, understood what was meant by all of these terms. Uh, we came in making a lot of assumptions that people, you know, knew where the data was, or, uh, you know, that data was, you know, the starting point for everything. But then we soon began to realize, well, you know, most agencies aren't even collecting data <laughs> before we can even get to the like more like critical questions of like critiquing the data. Um, most uh, members, staff aren't asking, well, how will people be impacted? Um, how will different communities be impacted? And so the biggest lesson was that we had to take a step back and really start from the beginning. Um, and we realized that that's okay because this work is so new. Um, the language that we're using, we had to come to a shared understanding. And whether we're talking about advancing equity, whether we are aiming to achieve equal outcomes, or here in DC, whether we're focused on racial equity, one of the things that can, you know, that I, I hope I can relay, uh, you know, to, to uh, all the attendees, uh, attendees is that it's okay to work to uh, grow that shared understanding. Um, and it's okay not to always know, um, you know, what role, whether it's you're in academia, a think tank, it's okay to try to figure out these very complex problems because when we try to start, you know, making definitive determinations, um, when we try to ask agency directors uh, very difficult questions about what they're doing around racial equity, you know, we got a lot of pushback. And a lot of agency directors felt attacked by the, the nature of questions because they just had not been doing it. And so once we took a step back and gave people tools, and so we created a toolkit called Design and Racially Equitable Legislation. We created a toolkit focused on uh, performance and budget oversight. Uh, we created um, a, a extensive report on how to achieve uh, racially equitable COVID vaccine distribution. And all of these things are helping people to uh, um, achieve a shared understanding of, of what racial equity actually is. Uh, are those toolkits available for others who, who may want to learn more about what you've done? Yeah, and so I can drop them um, in the chat and especially like the Designing Racially Equitable Toolkit, that was something that we um, hope could be adapted um, by whether it's uh, people in the private sector, um, in, in the federal government. Um, and so I'll drop that in the chat. And again, this, the intent behind it is so that we could all begin to work uh, from, from, from the same page, from the same shared definitions of things. And so I'll drop that in the chat now. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Lefwich, you've, you've studied this issue from, from an academic perspective. I'm curious if you, if you might wanna share some thoughts as well about lessons learned from racial equity that might be applicable to some other challenges, other aspects Absolutely. of equity. Absolutely. I think that when we talk about like lessons learned and we're looking at racial equity, it's so, there are so many disparities in so many different areas. So if we're talking about education, infant mortality, if we're talking about healthcare and access. And so I'm the president of the YWCA of Mahoning Valley. And one of the issues that we were looking at was the high infant mortality rate in Mahoning Valley, especially for women of color, it was three times that of white women. And it had nothing to do with education. It had nothing to do with access to healthcare. A lot of it just had to do with being the, the stress of being a black woman. And so we had to really look and find because when we start looking at race, a lot of times, like I said, we think it's tied to something else. So, well, it's not race, it's access to care. But when you look at all things being equal and you find out that the infant mortality rate is still higher for black women 
in the United States than in some third world countries, you really start to question what is the problem with that? And so from an academic standpoint, you know, we do the research, we collect the data and we're like, these are the numbers, these are the facts. So what needs to be done? And so we start looking at stress. Mm -hmm. One of the things that people don't wanna discuss is the mental health component, but mm -hmm. being really, you know, it's a real thing to talk about self-care and taking care of yourself and, and, having, and having time to relieve stress <clears throat> because it, it becomes a problem with just, it could be a life or death situation. And so it's important a lot of times when we look at equity, but when we say race and we say, I know that it makes people feel uncomfortable nobody wants to talk about things that happen, but that's, that's the reality, right? The numbers are showing us and the data is showing us that we have to face this head on and we have to be very cognizant in our day-to-day -day lives and when we're talking with people. And so when we provide services and so sometimes we, this is in every area from legal, prosecution, you know, like I said, in higher education. And when we look at retention rates, a lot of times the assumption is, well, the students got a poor education. So the African-American students are dropping out. But when we looked at the numbers, I said, well, look at this, 75% of our students that we are not retaining who are African-American are what we call high achieving students. They have a 3.5 or above and they are leaving. That means we are not retaining our students. That means it's not about, so creating programs to help academic achievement is not what we need to address that situation. We need inclusive programming. We need policies. We need to do exit interviews. We need to figure out how to make those students feel welcome. And it sounds so simple, but people just, you know, sometimes we overthink the situation. It could just be, hey, we just need a place. We need a safe space to go. So I think that it's very important when we talk about this issue and we talk about race to not be afraid of it. It's not always, it's not a, some people take it personally, right? It's not an attack on you. It's not a, it's not, well, white people did this. It's not that it's, these are what we show. And at some point we should be able to be more inclusive, but we have to start somewhere. And so while we still have the numbers and we still have the data, we can develop programs that may not just focus on helping and we do have students that are that are struggling, right, with academics, but we have programs in place for those. So what we don't have are those social programs, those mental health programs, those programs that deal with the, the microaggressions that seem serious. But, you know, when you live this day after day after day, and some people say it's no big deal, it can become a really big deal. It can, it can, you can get to a point where you decide, you know, I'm, I'm at a point where I've decided that it's probably not in the best interest of my, <laughs> my son to ever be the only black child in a school, in a camp, in a church, in a program, no matter how great that program is, it needs to have some inclus inclusivity because what I realize is that that trauma is real and I can't undo the trauma. So we have to just from doing the research and the data understand that we want to go places where there are inclusivity, where there is equity, and where people understand the importance of doing that work and including those groups. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's very, very helpful. Um, so, uh, Dr. Levy, let me uh, come back to you with a with a data question. Um, uh, so, happy happy to come back to the issue of the challenges associated with data. Uh, but um, Dr. Lefwich's story, um, I think, just just highlighted how data can actually be useful in at least identifying certain issues, right, and getting people focused on the right the right challenge, which can then be addressed perhaps in in some other ways. C can you build on that and, and maybe talk a little about how uh, examples of data actually being useful in addressing this issue, um, sort of the positive side of it? Uh, uh, and if you you know, of course, if you want to also jump in on some of the some of the challenges, that would be great. But um, obviously, data data can be a great starting place to to identify areas to then you know focus one's attention. So, if you could talk about that, that'd be great. Yeah. So, I think what Dr. Jackson uh, Lefwich talked about is really important in from a data perspective in recognizing uh, that we need to be measuring and looking for disparities. We have to be doing this proactively. We, if we're not looking 
for disparities and inequities, um, then it makes it that much harder uh, to do the equity work. So uh, this should be uh, something that everyone uh, is doing. And, uh, you know, the, in terms of lessons learned here, um, it reminds me a bit, uh, as folks are talking about the, the debate at the Supreme Court uh, between John Roberts and, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, where John Roberts said the best way to stop discriminating on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. Um, and then Ruth Bader Ginsburg responds uh, to Roberts' comment uh, by arguing that, well, if we have a problem that is uh, the result of racism and is uh, racist in nature, how do we address that? Uh, without a solution that's at least race conscious. And I think uh, that's sort of the crux of where we are right now as a country. Uh, the Biden administration has proposed uh, some race conscious policies. Those have been uh, struck down uh, in the courts or at least delayed in the courts, uh, grants to farmers uh, as one example here. Uh, and. Uh, it's a it's going to be hard to address the issues of longstanding racism um, if we can't have race conscious policies. Um, it's not saying it's not doable, but the most effective solutions to uh, addressing racism are going to be policies that actually acknowledge racism um, and then try and remediate its consequences. Uh, so we both need to be race conscious in our policy making, but then we actually need to also be doing data collection. And I think I want to highlight um, one example of this historically um, and sort of the vein of lessons learned, uh, not only for racial equity, but for equity uh, more broadly. So uh, we have to be wary of unintended consequences even of our uh, pro-equity policies. We can have good policies um, that then have negative impacts, uh, which sort of echoes the, the idea of uh, measuring data, being looking at impact, looking at impacts um, and having this equity lens embedded throughout our work. Uh, so we're all aware, or I hope we're all aware of our history of racist housing policy in the United States. Um, through the early to mid 20th century, characterized by the exclusion of Black Americans from certain neighborhoods, from mortgage markets, um, investment in white neighborhoods, and um, disinvestment or non-investment in primarily Black neighborhoods, um, or even uh, neighborhoods that had only a few Black presidents. Um, and some of the civil rights era policies were intended to address this, right? Um, we have the Fair Housing Act, we have the HUD Act, a number of other policies. Um, but there's uh, a really important recent book by uh, Kianga uh, Yamada Taylor uh, that shows policies like the HUD Act uh, that were intended to address our racist housing policy uh, by investing in and building housing in low income and uh, predominantly black neighborhoods actually led to a new form of inequality which she terms as the predatory inclusion of Black Americans. So moving from exclusion to predatory inclusion. Um, and the policies became predatorily inclusive uh, because federal oversight of new loan products um, and housing construction was very limited. And so uh, this led to an extraction of wealth from Black communities uh, by banks, by the mortgage industry, and by others. So even uh, policies that were intended to invest uh, in predominantly Black communities and promote Black wealth uh, ended up actually uh, in the long term leading to our subprime mortgage crisis, uh, leading to a destruction uh, of wealth uh, during the Great Recession, for example, and uh, that desperately uh, was borne by Black Americans. So uh, I think this is a cautionary tale about uh, the importance of embedding equity work and equity measurement um, throughout our process here and identifying problems 
um, which are many, uh, in designing policy solutions and then having the long-term follow through uh, to make sure that policies are actually uh, achieving equity. And if I could just add to that quickly, if, if we have time, I, I mean, I, I think you hit the, the nail on the head. Um, it's, it's not just, you know, one of the things that I just wanted to underscore is it's not that these things happened like centuries ago. Like we could still trace the uh, unintended consequences of, or maybe intended consequences of some of those racist policies and their impact on uh, black communities and other communities of color. But, you know, one of the things we're doing here in DC is evaluating current legislation that will still have the unintended consequence of exacerbation, uh, exacerbating racial inequities. Um, and so uh, one of the first things that uh, my office um, conducted a review on was DC's comprehensive plan, which is this massive, um, you know, 1500 page document that sets land use and housing policies, um, goals for economic development, uh, small business participation for the district for the next 20 years. And when it was sent down to us um, and we began our preliminary analysis, there are some extremely problematic language that was still in there. You know, it would say things like, um, you know, fair housing policies should be adhered to. And we're like, well, wait a minute, like, no, they must be adhered to. <laughs> like, don't you know the history of redlining here? or it would say things to the effect of um, all businesses in the district must have an opportunity to succeed. And something uh, that may be so harmless on the surface, of course we want all businesses to succeed. But then when you start to look at the data and see that one in four businesses, uh, black businesses in DC have closed and are slated not to reopen due to COVID, then you understand that certain redress needs to uh, be provided so that those black and minority businesses can actually recover. Um, and if we aren't being uh, specific in how we are providing um, uh, uh, recovery dollars, um, extra technical assistance to those businesses, uh, these racial inequities that we see will continue to persist. Yeah, thank you for jumping in. Uh, Dr. Lefwich, do you wanna have the last word? Oh, they, I think everyone did a great job, but I would just like to add about um, what Dr. McClure was adding about how these policies are not new and they've been happening for so long. And so when we talk about, you know, fair housing or equity, but when we don't want to get into the same instance. And so one of the one of the issues we talk about is like concentrated poverty and how we, we might have blacks or brown people that live in these concentrated areas of poverty, which becomes very problematic because there aren't, there aren't development being ha happening, investment, generational wealth. Whereas if you look at whites, they tend not to be in concentrated poverty. So they may still be in areas where they can thrive, not food deserts, they have access to. So all those different areas. And when we look at the, you know, healthcare and our social determinants of health, housing is a big one. And so when we look at policies, one of the, one of the suggestions that we were talking about is maybe what we need to do when we do fair housing is not put concentrated houses together. Maybe we need to build homes in different areas and sprinkle them about so that we're not grouping or just creating problems that we see have not been effective, right? The definition of crazy is to do the same thing over and over and expect different results. So if we keep building low income housing and then we're like, oh, these low income housing areas aren't thriving. Well, maybe we shouldn't put them all together, right? Maybe there has to be a different plan and look into development and look and see what other countries are doing and what other areas are doing, because we know that that does not work. And we know that people have to have access and be around and be able to get food for their families, have access to good schools. I live in Ohio, we fund our schools off of property taxes. The Supreme Court has ruled six times saying that that has been unconstitutional. We still fund our schools, our public schools based off of property taxes. So we know that that is ineffective. We have not made the change that needs to be made to fix those issues. So I think that one of the things that I would just end with is being 
very conscious about what we do, how we do it, and be opening to saying that maybe we, it's time to change what we've been doing in the past. Thank you, panelists. Uh, this is Janine Patterson again. I am going to uh, share some questions that have been coming in through the chat. This has just been a wonderful conversation. Um, and so I'll, I'll just start by saying that there have been a lot of kudos coming in through the chat. And we just appreciate your thoughts and your willingness to lean in on this. Um, I want to take it back to the beginning of the conversation where we were talking about the definition of equity. Um, and several of you used terms. Um, opportunity and outcome. And it's something that's come up many times. Um, one of the one of our audience members asked, is there a difference in expecting equal opportunity or equal outcome? Just interested in, in getting you to, to baseline on that a little bit. And why don't we start with you, Dr. Jackson Lefwich, and then we'll, we'll go around. That's a great question. And I would I would just say that opportunity doesn't always equal outcomes. And that was one of the things that I, I would say, equity, I always say, is the opportunity because in the world that we live in, people need to have the opportunity. Now, just because you are giving the opportunity does not mean that you will be successful, does not mean that there will always be a positive outcome, but at least you now have the chance or the opportunity to make your own outcome and to write your own story. But if you don't even have the opportunity given to you, then you're going to have no outcome at all. And so I, I remember people were telling me, I tell people this all the time, you know, I'm going to give you knowledge and skills and critical thinking, and I want you to be successful in the world. But that may not always translate, depending on how you interview, depending on some of the other things. I've given you these tools. I'm going to send you out. Now, it's up to you to be able to use these tools and to translate them into something. It may happen. Great. It may not. But that's okay. Because if it doesn't happen, if you don't get that outcome, you will get another opportunity. And so as long as you have opportunities, you can continue to strive to work towards that outcome. And I feel eventually they will get those equitable outcomes. Thank you, Dr. Levy. Yeah, so I think um, equal opportunity might not look, as we've talked about, like an equivalent amount of resources allocated to each person. So um, if we have equal opportunity, uh, then we won't see massive racial and ethnic disparities in outcomes uh, because there are no differences by race and ethnicity except those which we've socially constructed. So. Uh, Equitable opportunity uh, will ultimately, as Dr. Leftwich was just talking about, lead to equitable outcomes. They're not, not necessarily the same thing, uh, but I think one can lead to the other. Uh, but the, the rub is equitable opportunity might not look like what we think it looks like. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add, Dr. McClure. No, and I know we want to get to other questions. I would just say a, an actual example of that here in DC was how the district rolled out uh, their actual COVID vaccine distribution. Um, it was apparently equal. <laughs> so the vaccine centers were literally located and um, the minor team actually helped us uh, go through this when we were doing our training to illustrate this very point. So when the district first rolled out its vaccine, it was done at like two centers in every ward or every um, DC is broken into eight wards. And so I think like there are two distribution sites in every ward. Well, once you started looking at the numbers of who was getting vaccinated, we saw these huge racial disparities and that e equal opportunity was not leading to equal outcomes. Even to this day, we see that amongst students in DC or those between the ages of 12 and 15, just 1% of students in Ward 8, which is predominantly Black, have been fully vaccinated compared to upwards of 20% of uh, students uh, between the ages of 12 to 15 in Ward 3, which is one of the wider, more affluent areas. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm, I can't wait to see what equal opportunity looks like in this country. <laughs> I don't know if I've seen it yet, 
<laughs> um, but you know, definitely something that we should be striving towards. But you know, if, if someone's seen it, please let me know what it looks like. So this next question, um, thank you. This question is is also for you, Dr. McClure, although I'm sure the other panelists um, may have some something as well. How do you address data situations where service providers assert that they address racial inequity and bias by not including race on applications for services? Um, if we don't see race in the application process, then we can't be biased. Um, and it closes with a with an 06, which I'm sure you, you know what that means there. <laughs> and uh, oh, 06 to Brother Thomas uh, for asking that, that question. Um, so one of the interesting things that we've actually spent a lot of time looking at is, um, for example, the, uh, how the tax code is established. The tax code is race neutral, but um, you know, nationally, locally, we see extreme amounts of um, racial inequities uh, in um, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, I'm trying to, how much time do we have? <laughs> we have another five minutes or so. Okay. So I'll, there are huge disparities um, and the huge disparities that are created because of race neutral policies. Um, I, I have so much I want to say, but I definitely want to be respectful to to other panelists. Um, one of the things that we have encouraged the district to look at is how these race neutral policies um, lead to uh, inequitable outcomes. Um, there's a lot more I wanted to say on that, but I you know, definitely want to be respectful of the time we have here. Yeah, and I'll offer to the other panelists to see if there's anything they'd like to add. I would just say, it sounds like they're saying colorblindness. Mm -hmm. And I've heard a lot about the colorblindness theory that we shouldn't talk about race because that's racist. But I think <laughs> and, uh, Dr. McClure, you'll be very, very kind. But the reality is you can't discriminate on race and create a bunch of racial disparities and then say, oops, we're not gonna look at race anymore. You have to fix the hole and the issues that you've created before you can get to a place where you don't look at race. So there are so many issues in terms of disparities and even if you don't look at it on applications like I was mentioning earlier microaggressions the way that people wear their hair that they had to pass literally pass legislation so that people could wear their hair the way it grows out of their head right like that should not have to been legislated but that is where we are and so we can't say well we want to be colorblind and not address the issues that when you were being racist for years, created. So there was a problem. So until we fix the problem, until we close the gap, we can't have race neutral policies. It won't work. They'll ultimately just create and continue on with the disparities. They'll widen the gap. And people who say that, I think they know that, but that's their way of saying, no, it's not a, a big deal. So I think it's very important to say until we fix the problem from the past, until we can close these gaps, until we can fix some of the issues that we are still having, then no, we can't be race neutral and we can, and colorblindness will not work. Yeah, and if I could just briefly um, go off of that, it's, you know, France, for example, doesn't measure race and ethnicity in their national data collection. It doesn't mean that there aren't racial and ethnic inequalities in France. It just means we don't have data on it. Um, and to uh, go off of Dr. Left, which is last point, um, if uh, you know, the, the status quo, if we don't do anything else, will perpetuate. Doing nothing, um, while maybe not an intentionally racist action, nevertheless will perpetuate racism. So we have to take actions. Um, and that's why it's important to institutionalize equity, um, like Dr. McClure was talking about in their equity impact assessments. I'm sorry if I got the moniker incorrect there. Um, in all legislative work, in all program work uh, throughout the government. Uh, I know we have um, a lot of processes that we already have to go through, 
Uh, but if you look at the history of the United States, I think that one's pretty important. Well, thank you, uh, thank you for that. Thank you all, um, panelists, and and um, and Irv as our moderator for this incredibly thought provoking discussion. I wish we we had a little bit more time um, uh, to continue to pull the thread. Um, uh, so we'll have to look to have you all back for another for another um, panel discussion. Um, but now I think we're going to transition to our fireside chat, and I am going to um, turn this virtual mic back over to, to Jim Cook. Uh, Jim? Thank you, Janine. And thanks again to all of our panelists for uh, your thoughts, your insights, uh, and your comments today. Excellent discussion. So uh, last but not least, I'd like to uh, introduce our guest for this virtual fireside chat. And uh, speaking for myself, I can't wait till we can do a fireside chat in person again. Um, in the short time that I've known our next guest, I found her to be an incredible teacher, incredibly compassionate individual, and uh, she has had an impact on my thinking just in that short period of time. And I trust that she will with yours as well. Our guest today for our fireside chat is Dr. Rajade Barry James. She's an associate professor of public administration at the School of Public and International Affairs at North Carolina State University and chair elect of the faculty. Her research and teaching focus on social equity, program evaluation, and research methods. And in a recent co authored book, Why Research Methods Matter Essential Skills in Decision Making, she focuses on real world policy making and evidence to support decision making. She earned her BS in business administration from Ryder University, her master's of public administration from Keene University, and her PhD in public administration from Rutgers University at Newark, specializing in productive public management. Her dissertation examined the functions, duties, and responsibilities of leaders as advocates of social change. Dr. Barry James is a fellow at the National Academy of Public Administration and vice chair of the Standing Panel on Social Equity. Welcome, Dr. Barry James. Thank you so much, Jim. Ah. So I understand I'm having some problems with my uh, audio, so I'm going to hold my mic up just to make sure that you can hear my questions. Awesome. All right. So for my first question, Dr. Barry James, many who are working to address systemic inequities often take a particular aspect and focus strictly there, such as data, research, or partnerships. How can we ensure that this work converges to make a difference in public and private systems? Well, first of all, I want to thank you so much for hosting this opportunity to listen and learn. Um, I'm really encouraged by your intentional effort and the commitment of you and your colleagues and our nation really to ensure equitable outcomes for the American people. I, um, I really think that we should really look closely at this executive order. You know, one of the things that I do in my classroom for, for all the time I've been teaching is really look at the federal register, right? To figure out what our country is doing. And what our country is doing right here, right now is making equity important and understanding the way in which we have to advance racial equity in our, in our current society. Um, the definition talked about, uh, being consistent um, and systematic, looking at fair, just, and impartial treatment of all people. And then it goes on to talk about sort of um, operationalize, if you will, um, who the people are, um, what status do they enjoy in our society? What social group do they belong to? I think that's really important. Many of us researchers know we start with this concept equity, and then we go on to operationalize it. How are we going to measure it? And in this context, our president has measured equity for all of us very clearly with a cadre of social equity cheerleaders and champions that really talk about um, these are the people, uh, these are the groups, these are the persons, and, and, and these are this is the way in which they've been adversely impacted in what we've done before. So going forward, we might be looking at something different and we should all expect 
something different. We should expect a coordinated effort. We should expect a focus on um, social and economic issues that really um, help us understand what government does, why we do it, how we fund it, and the impact that it has on um, our nation, and more importantly, our people, right? I, I, I know like you, um, I'm thankful that they stopped cutting the grass. They were cutting the grass in my neighborhood from, you know, eight o'clock this morning onward, and it's sort of a preoccupied approach to making sure that the neighborhood looks perfect, right? Mm -hmm. But the truth is, is that some of us are riding out the crisis, the COVID-19 crisis from our safe neighborhoods, for me, from my virtual office and in our communities. And the truth is some of us are really working to, as my grandmother would say, um, put food on the table and keep clothes on our backs, right? And so for the American people, our movements, our moments, our matters reflect centuries of struggle. And so we have to, the American people are relying on academics and practitioners to coordinate efforts to make sure that um, we address um, equal opportunity, right? that we recommit to equal opportunity to ensure that it belongs to all of us and not just some of us to make sure that our public policies and our research practices uncover what I like to call, and I don't like to say this, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it among friends and family and uh, cohorts that we have the obligation to respond to the call to uncover persistent disparities that impact the American people. So I think that's what we're doing, to be quite honest. Um, and I think that some of it, thanks for mentioning our book, Why Research Methods Matter. I think some of that really, as you heard um, earlier this morning, comes down to the way in which we collect and analyze data. Now I wanna tell you that every generation has a gap. Um, not just the gap store, but these particular absorbable, observable, palpable gaps in our society. So like educational gaps and economic gaps and employment gaps and healthcare gaps, gaps that really teach us something about what people feel and what they experience in communities and in neighborhoods and in our workplaces. And so um, what we also don't have Sometimes, sometimes we do. We don't have the push for creating usable knowledge. So what is it that we know? What is it that we want to know? And what is it that we've learned? And certainly we have case study after case study after case study. It's, I, it's, it's easier to identify the gap, right? To stand right in the gap and say, hey, look, this is not working. And so therefore we have to pivot. We have to change our priority. We have to increase more funding. We have to look for different ways, strategies, change our theory of change, our if then, right? For those of us who um, sort of get down like that. If we do this, then what are the expectations that we're likely to see? Um, and so that's really a focus for many of us on continuous improvement, right? That's the mission critical that we talk about, even though we don't sort of, um, we don't, we might say mission critical as a buzzword, um, but the reality is we're looking for ways to mitigate, mitigate um, sort of, you know, things that we need to change, right? Um, reduce the impact that we see or the, the disparity that we created, not in the classroom, not at the university, not in our community, not at our state, but also in our government at the federal level, that we create some of the disparities that we see. And so now it's our chance as champions and cheerleaders to focus in on uh, those disparities and narrow the gap. Um, close the gap, fill in the gap, stand in the gap, experience the gap, understand the gap, right? And by doing so, I think that we get where we're going, really. Right. Well, you mentioned in, in that answer, you talked a little bit or touched on the relationship between the federal uh, government and state and local levels. I want to come back to that in a moment, but you said something else that I'd like to ask you a follow-on question on, because you talked a lot about understanding. And as a researcher, part of your job is to, to do the study, to do the exploration, 
And part of your passion, of course, is to reveal things for others to help them understand so they can act. And 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 it strikes me that uh, that a sim similar comments were made by the panelists, and it takes me back even to the hearing yesterday, I believe it was, where the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Chiefs of Staff, in his response to a questioner, said those words: "I want to understand. I want to know." And so that's the challenge of data: is to help us understand and to help us know. So how do we do that? How do you, in your role, help people understand that this is an imperative? that they're not under attack. And this is something that we should all care about. Well, you know, I, I feel like I'm in a safe space to confess. Um, maybe you've heard before that I was raised Catholic, right? So that gave me two things, the ability to talk about things I don't understand and the ability to sort of um, care about others, right? Mm -hmm. um, I learned that growing up in my religious training and my religious community and my religious household. Um, I think that as a program evaluator um, training, right? Um, I learned that there are important aspects of um, funding Maybe I learn that through compliance. Maybe I credit OMB for teaching me that, right? That, or maybe I've already had that in my heart, you know, that essentially when you are given money, right, when you're a steward of the American dollar, what that means is that you have a responsibility to, one, do the things you said you were going to do. Um, two, so that's the process evaluation of it, right? Sort of identify how it is you sort of put this program together to address this unmet need. What, who are the people that are there? What are the things that you've done? How long does it take? How much did you do? What really matters in this process? And then the other piece is really the outcome. So, okay, you've been committed to this cause that's already been identified as a priority. And given that commitment, um, you know, how much of it did you do and how many people did you serve and what is the difference that it's made for the people that you serve and did you do what we asked you to do and then the last piece is really about um, the, the service right does it matter. And I can't tell you if what we're doing matters, we have to go to the American people. In fact, we need to pull them into um, the public discourse, right? The civic square, the space where we are to say, we have recognized your need. We have committed to helping to figure out how to help you. That's a compassionate approach. We have decided to prioritize your need and offer funding there. Maybe we get our elected officials to do that for us. And we also get our committed public servants to do that as well. And then now we need to know, did it work, right? And if it worked, tell us more so we can replicate it, right? And if it didn't work, tell us what are the unmet needs, right? For me, that's an evaluation approach, not just, you know, in size and scope, right? So certainly we could look at one little program and then think about the local context and think about whether we can scale it up across the state or across the country. Certainly from a top-down approach, we can look at, you know, the charge that Congress gives us. We recognize that this pain is great, that this priority is, um, has elevated and we're gonna address this unmet need. So here's the funding that's available and let's get to work. And collectively we coordinate to make that, make that work um, meaningful, right? But then the last piece of it is, is, okay, did it work? And did the people appreciate it? And do they need other things? And we've learned all that from COVID. I um, worked with a team of, um, researchers at Virginia Commonwealth University. And I'm not name dropping, I'm just talking about the work, right? And we worked on um, helping Virginia 
during the crisis. But I also evaluated, looked at, examined some data outcomes in all of the FEMA region three plus North Carolina to identify we are, you know, the practice, right? The head, my head and my heart, they connect sometimes. And I say, okay, we're in a crisis. Um, we know that we have the resources that are necessary and we know that we're doing the work, right? There's some activities there, but yet after a short period of time, a year, um, who have we helped? And that's great news. But then you have to ask the question, who else do we need to help, right? And so I think that's really the equity question. Um, who do we help and who else needs to help? And let's get right to it. There are different tools and techniques. I love the conversation this morning about the data and more insight into how we use information, understanding and recognizing that bias is built in to information that we collect, right? Um, and I've been on that side of the house where as a um, program evaluator for a program in Ohio, a drug treatment and recovery program that served people for 10 years, right? It's a long time to be committed to a cause, but trying to provide service to people or follow up part of our compliance for people who don't have homes, is it possible? Sure it is. Can you find them? Absolutely. What do you need to know? Not necessarily where they sleep at night or where they hang out. You sort of need to know, you know more about them and who cares about them. So that social connectedness, that infrastructure, that um, social safety net, right? It catches us all if someone extends the hand to do so. So I don't know if I answer your question, but yeah, it was on you, my heart. You did. And actually, um, the uh, you, you've connected the discussion around federal, state, and local uh, and community engagement with measuring impact. And just like maybe just ask a follow on there, because I know Nancy Potok, Dr. Nancy Potok in her comments this morning, earlier today, did talk about that community involvement and that being one of the objectives of the executive order. Can you talk a little bit about how that looks from your perspective and what you would expect the federal government and federal agencies to be doing to more effectively engage the communities uh, and work between federal, state, local, and, uh, and, and public organizations. Sure. I um, First, I want to say thank you so much for having Nancy talk to us early this morning. Um, she definitely inspired me, um, and I'm thankful for her service and her leadership. Um, I do want to say that it's my teenagers who teach me about idioms, right? And so the one that I'm fond of saying before I even knew what an idiom was, because so, it's been a while since I've been in you know, high school, middle school, but it's the one that says what gets measured gets done. Um, ensuring that our collective effort is measured by our commitment to foster social equity and social justice, advancing Racial equity is um, really important, but racism is the chronic problem in our American society. And you know, it's not just our problem, it's a problem that is seen around the world as evidenced by the Black Lives Matter movement and other social movements that demand change. And so I wanna just say for centuries, right? Racial, ethnic, and social groups have experienced discrimination, segregation, alienation, isolation. And we see collectively that um, we have to address the intentional and unintentional effect or impact of racism. Um, and so try as we might, we fail sometimes. COVID is our lesson learned. I don't know about you, Jim, but at night I look at excess deaths. I'm thankful that the CDC has made this data open and available to small time consumers of data like me. But in looking at that data, right, based on what we have collected so far, I noticed a couple things. We are like the rest of the world. We, um, women are more likely to catch COVID and men are likely more likely to die from it. We are also like each state in that the rates of infection are high disproportionately so for Black and Hispanic um, people or communities, right? And then the likelihood of isolation uh, or hospitalization, we don't know a lot about, but when we look at that excess, excess 
death data, now that we have it available and accessible to us, we're learning something else. We know that Blacks and Hispanics account for, in each category, about one third of excess deaths. What we also know is what you know, some of us have been secretly praying, hoping that it wasn't the case, that there's lots of death from drug overdose, right? There's lots of isolation. There are a lot of people who can't access vaccines. You use a tool and a technique like a relative rate index. I used that before when we were looking at the disproportionate minority contact with um, Black and Hispanic and Asian juveniles through juvenile court. We used it easily, that, that technique, relative rate, given equal opportunity in society, how likely are you to be engaged in the juvenile justice system? How likely are you to be uh, engaged at different levels of decision points, right? And at what point can we change policy, practice, or approach to even out the discrimination that we see or the disproportionality that occurs, right? Those are all evidence-based approaches to making equity front and center in everything we do. But for the COVID case, right? And we'll talk about COVID as we get through this crisis. It'll be a case that we'll all study through the COVID case. What we know is what we always knew. The National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine warned us that when we roll out the vaccines, we have to keep front and center communities that have a high burden of disease. And for me, these are lessons learned, right? And so the way then is working from top down and bottom up with engaged communities and thought leaders and subject matter experts so that we could address the problems that continue to plague us. Some of these problems plagued us for centuries, for decades, and in the here and now. And so I think that the alignment issue is an issue that's very important. Can we align? equitable solutions in the delivery of services that benefit people, all people in local government and state government and at the federal level. Can we do it? Because that's what we'll need to do in order to advance racial equity and provide support for vulnerable people. Very, I mean, I, I can keep going because I got stuff to say. <laughs> I, well, every conversation with you is to me feels far too short. Um, and we only have a couple minutes, but before right. we go, I would really like to ask you this question. Mm -hmm. Talk about the lesson of the silver label. Um, you know, we talk in, in equity, we talk about um, talking the talk and walking the walk. And so I'll share with you something that was shared with me oh, 30, five years ago when I was a young person entering into academia. And I was learning about diversity, um, having come from the beach community in New Jersey, having gone to a predominantly white institution, having been spent mostly four years as the only black or one of few black students in a class, you know, I really didn't know a lot about um, equity and equal opportunity, but I did work as a research assistant for the New Jersey Department of Higher Education in the Educational Opportunity Fund Program. And as you might imagine, I was a research assistant, you know, so I collected data that was used to determine if this program, if these policies worked, right, for people who are educationally and economically disadvantaged. And you know how it is when you're young and you're ready to get started and you're committed to public service, you want to jump right in. So I worked at a university at the age of 22. And um, I worked with a lot of different people and we um, embodied, embraced the spirit of multicultural, multicultural um, programming and assessment and ideas and sharing. And so it was at that space and I'll just get right to it, that I heard a story that changed my life, really that helped me understand, um, you know, what it is that I should commit to doing, right? And so it was really about, you know, the ladle, the soup ladle and the bowl. And I have this bowl here. I've used it 
lots of years, right? Um, you know, essentially it holds, it holds ladles. And if you could imagine a soup ladle is, you know, you make soup, right? You know, it warms the heart. It's the thing that your mom makes for you that keeps you whole and reminds you of love. But, you know, it's an instrument in your hand. So imagine if we created this world where we had a table and lots of us walk in boardrooms and classrooms and um, conference rooms and even our dining rooms every single day. There's always a table and a chair. Sometimes there's not enough chairs for everyone. So we have to move over and make room and offer a seat. Sometimes we have to come in that room and bring our own chair, right? But the instrument that's there waiting for us to get what's in the center of the table is really that soup ladle, long enough, elegant in, in, in design, right? And so we take that ladle and we reach for it, we go for it, we look for the nourishment. And as we go with our own ladles and we reach into that bowl, the reality is that um, when we come back to feed ourselves, we spill some things, we waste some things, right? We might never reach our mouth using the ladle, the only instrument that we have. Cause you, you know, the table's big, right? It includes all of us, right? That's really a equity perspective. Um, but we all have an opportunity to go for it and we do go for it and we waste a lot of time and effort. But yet, you know, after trial and error, after examining not only our window of opportunity, but our mirror of self-reflection, what we realize is that if we simply turn and feed the other, one other, right, then what will happen is that person, maybe after multiple attempts, right, after we reach out and feed the other person, that person will turn and feed us. And so that story has stayed with me my whole life. Um, and as I do cultural competence training and other kinds of DEI training, I sometimes use that story. I'm often, I got lots of these ladles back here and I bet, you know, within the next week you'll have your own. Um, just as a reminder that the things we need to turn our world around are the things that we already have. Every single one of us has a spoon or ladle or instrument to feed another. And so what we need to do is just keep it close by, right? Remind ourselves that we have what we need, but now what we need to do is commit to it. So that's my story. All right. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing your insights. Uh, as I said, any conversation with you seems to last uh, far too short, be far too short. We look forward to perhaps having you back again in this, at a future event. Uh, as we continue this conversation and work together as a community to address what is clearly, I believe, a social, economic, and moral obligation to, to address systemic uh, and longstanding inequities in society. So thank you again for sharing your thoughts. Thank you again to all of the speakers uh, who participated today and to the attendees. So to close today, I'd like to introduce uh, Stephanie Turner, MITRE Vice President for Inclusion and Diversity and to Innovation. Stephanie, over to you. Thank you, Jim, and, and wow, thank you for the soup ladle, Dr. Mary James. I definitely have received my nourishment from this morning, and I say it's a great way to start the day. Um, this discussion was extremely impactful and meaningful, and personally for me, and um, has given me the inspiration to continue to do what we need to do. Uh, my name is Stephanie Turner, and I'm the Vice President for Inclusion, Diversity, and Social Innovation here at MITRE. It is really an honor to be at MITRE right now at such a pivotal time on structural inequities and their lingering impacts that still plague our nation. As we have gathered here to explore our individual and collective roles in addressing this challenge, it is important for me to note that we are also doing transformative work within MITRE as I'm sure many of you are doing within your own organizations. In my role, our focus is to enable catalytic conversations that stimulate awareness, acceptance, and positive long-lasting cultural change at MITRE. We realize that our internal cultural growth will resonate in how impactful we are able to be extremely and externally, um, well, to be able to externally be, be, we are able to be externally year of strategic partnerships and engagement within our communities. A little tongue tied there. Our growth is stimulated by constant learning, evolution, and empathy for others. Towards this end, as you have heard from Jim and Carrie earlier, 
We invite you to learn from and contribute to an online community where we can share relevant tools, frameworks, data, and practices. Engage with this community via our new social justice platform site at sjp.mitre.org. Once again, thank you all for joining us and we look forward to engaging with you soon. Be well.